Welcome to Dabbles, a conversation with series, where you'll hear candid conversations from current and experienced professionals to give you a realistic depiction of the challenges of entering and excelling in a specific industry. Hi, everyone, and uh, welcome to another episode of a conversation with series uh, by Dabble. Today, we have Lucas Shashang with us. Thanks for being with us today, Lucas. Well, thanks for having me. So uh, it's, this is an interesting discussion for us because you are a professional photographer um, and you're one of the first individuals we've sp spoken to about in the arts. So maybe you can give our audience a bit of a background on uh, the type of work you do and the type of clients you deal with. Okay, well, yeah, I am a photographer. Uh, I have a background in graphic design. Um, but yeah, I, uh, right now I'm working consistently with uh, four major clients. One is MLSC, so I'm working in sports. The other is uh, 515 Photo Company. They are a boutique wedding photography company. Uh, I'm working with uh, Thrive, which is a career wellness platform. So I do a lot of headshots, that sort of stuff for them. And then I work for Rain Company, which is a hospitality company. So they have a group of restaurants and a uh, cannabis dispensary amongst uh, numerous other private clients as well. Pretty diversified portfolio there. <laughs> Super diverse, yeah, definitely. So what um, what does you know photography mean to you? What really drew you to this field? I think most people would be really interested in knowing how do you get there. Yeah, um, I don't know. I, I think as a kid, I had sort of this idea. I wanted to work in like marketing at some point, uh, and then as I sort of you know grew into the, the creative field in, in high school, I spent a lot of time uh, building out graphics and stuff in Photoshop. Mm -hmm. uh, and then after um, after taking a photography class in high school, I sort of realized that there is an actual path to doing this professionally. I had always sort of been exposed to it as, as um, this is a hobby, you know, you can yeah. become a hobbyist and you can maybe make passive income or, or supplementary income, I guess, with, uh, with the arts, but it's not really something you can take seriously. And there was sort of a, there was sort of a moment where that view totally shifted and I realized that there was a possibility to do it professionally and, and actually, you know, build a career out of it. Uh, so after high school, I went to Humber for graphic design, uh, worked as a graphic designer for a little bit and then sort of became disenchanted with it. And at that point, that's when I realized, okay, like I did actually sort of have this hobbyist photography thing going and I had a yeah. lot of transferable skills. So I was like, hey, let's, uh, let's try to shift over and, and work in, in something that may be a little bit more fulfilling for me. And then that sort of, that got the ball rolling and yeah. You know, I think I started at OCAD in photography in 2014. So I guess we're seven, seven and a half years later. And it's, uh, you know, it's been pretty good. So it's, it's been a nice journey. Great. I think, I think that, um, that there must be some kind of barrier that makes it really intimidating to shift into, you know, a career in the arts where it's very skill set driven and uh, it's not easy to make it, right? I, I imagine it's a, it's a very difficult and intimidating process. What was the key hurdle that you had to get through there and, and you think most people would face when trying to jump into, say, a career in photography? Yeah, that's, that's a tough question. Um, I think, sort of touched on it a little bit, it's sort of um, bridging that gap and sort of finding the belief uh, in, in it actually being a viable option as a career. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it is difficult. Like it's a lot more difficult than I think people give it credit for. Um, you know, I think I think the biggest the biggest thing for me, the biggest sort of step towards realizing that it was a legitimate career option was when I first got my my first paying client, right. and not not like a friend, you know, going to shoot somebody's uh, somebody's band play, for example, right. or, or you know, oh, can I have some headshots for my resume, that sort of thing. Um, you know, like a real, a real client comes to you from, you know, somewhere or, you know, you, you cold call somebody and then eventually they say, Hey, look, like we love your work and we're really happy you reached out. Um, the first, the first paycheck that I got, that was like, you know, six, $700. I was like, Whoa, this is like, I did just one thing and I made $700 off of this. Yeah. You know, it, was, it was a lot of work, uh, but you know, it was one project and I was like, wow, this is, you know, this could be something. And yeah. so I, I think the biggest hurdle is definitely realizing and then seeing, you know, 
the proof of it that you can monetize. And I think that's, you know, I think with everything, but especially with, with um, the creative side of things, when you start to monetize, you know, it really changes the way you feel about it because, you know, it goes from, okay, you know, I'm doing this for fun. I enjoy this, you know, anything is, is a bonus. And then all of a sudden you're like, wow, like this can be lucrative. And, and, you know, I can continue to work towards, you know, making more. And I think, you know, obviously as a motivator, it's, it's huge to have something that to look forward to like that. So, you know, you don't want to say it's all about the money, which it's not, but you know, it's It's important. (laughs) It's it's definitely important, right? I could, I, you know, wouldn't be able to have this conversation with you if, you know, the money wasn't, um, you know, supporting me. Right. And it's, um, it's crazy. Like, I get, there's three major hurdles, I think, in retrospect now. One is sort of finding the belief and understanding that it is possible. Hmm. And then the second one is actually seeing the results, so getting paid. Yeah. And then the third one is seeing the results, at least in my, from my experience, seeing the results over an extended period of time, especially as a freelancer, yeah. and seeing, you know, okay, I can not only do this on occasion, I can do this consistently and I can actually build on this. And I think that's sort of the, the, those are the three major steps uh, in, in realizing and, and, you know, it's sort of convincing yourself that you can yeah. do it. I know that, that makes absolute sense. Um, I, I, really I rambly, but it, <laughs> you know, worked my way to a decent answer, I think. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, I think it, to get to that place where you know you're starting to see results, I assume there's certain skill sets that you need to have in place to see results, right? Because it's one thing to believe you can do it. Uh, I imagine there's certain skill sets you need to become successful. And uh, I'm not too familiar with photography, and I'm sure much of the audience is. And maybe you can describe to us um, how important is the you know not only the technical side of photography, but the, the business side of going around getting clients and, and building up your portfolio. Yeah, I, I would say, I would say there's two, you know, one A and, you know, one B kind of important aspects to running a photography business and being successful in it. I think crucially, the number one most important thing is you have to do good work. Yeah. Um, you can create wonderful concepts and, and, you know, have a really fantastic idea, but if you can't execute and, and create something that is visually appealing, it's going to fall flat and it just, it won't work. You, you lose clients if you have them, or you won't gain clients or you won't acquire new, new clients. If you can't at the very least attract somebody's, you know, whatever gaze will say, or attract somebody's, somebody's uh, attention. Mm-hmm. And then the second most important thing, and I think it's pretty, it's equally important, but you know, you don't, it doesn't, it's not crucial if you're creating great work. Um, you have to be socially adept, right? <laughs> you have to, you know, you, you really have to be a social butterfly. You have to be, you know, friendly. You have to constantly be staying in touch with people. Once you have a client, um, you know, for me, it's as simple as, you know, sending an Instagram DM to a story, like responding to a story and just staying in touch and, and interacting with people and making sure that you're sort of top of mind. And if you're not top of mind, you're at least somewhere there where they're like, oh, yeah, this guy he does photography um, yeah. and he's good at this. Or, you know, I, I've seen his work being for me, like being active on social media, like posting, you know, for example, if I shoot a Toronto FC game, I'll, I'll like to post two or three images from that immediately after just so it's like, hey, I was here. I shot this. You know, here's a reminder to everybody who's following me and paying attention. You know, this is what I do. Uh, I'm proud of what I do. I'm good at what I do, and and you know, making sure that there's still eyeballs on it. So, I mean, that's sort of a it's a little bit more nuanced. There's a lot of different aspects to it, but just staying socially relevant so that people are aware of what you're doing and how good you are. Uh, that's super, super, super important. No, that makes that makes complete sense. Yeah. Uh, I imagine that in itself is what half, at least half the work that you must be doing, right? I don't know if it's half the work. I, I, it's strange because like I'm, I'm sort of of two minds. It's, I think the pandemic is sort of um, further exposed sort of how I feel about this. 
when I'm at home, I try to just sort of detach. Like I don't, I try not to be on my phone. Like I'm terrible at responding to text messages, terrible at responding to the Instagram DMs. But on, on the flip side, when it comes to work, like I'm pretty, pretty on the ball, but being somebody that doesn't really have the luxury of working from home all the time, when I, I even just during the pandemic, like I've had to leave to go to work quite a bit. And so that sort of getting out of the house and being on the job, that's sort of when I do the majority of the work. So even if it's like, you know, um, taking the train in, cause I, you know, I've spent a lot of time in Mississauga, taking the train in to, to work uh, downtown, I would be on my phone answering Instagram messages, that sort of stuff. Now that I'm, I'm downtown, it's a little bit more at home now, but those sort of moments, um, you know, before work and after work it were really big for me, but at home, I try to like you know, decompress. So <laughs> when I say it's 50% of the work, I don't know. Should it be 50% of the work? Maybe. Fair point. Do you find uh, you get a lot of business through uh, platforms like Instagram? 100%, yeah. It's so funny. I remember when it first came out, I was just like, you know, this isn't for me. This is insane. The quality of my work will speak for itself. Um, okay which it does to some extent, but it's just so crucial to have, um, you know, if you don't have a big following on Instagram, like I, I don't certainly for a photographer. And I think for somebody that's doing the sort of work that I'm doing, uh, you know, working with clients that have like a multi-million, uh, multi-million follower platform mm -hmm. or audience. Um, I only have like 2000, you know, 2,100 followers on Instagram. So it's not a crazy, crazy amount, but uh, if, you have an engaged following, I think that's super, super important. Whether, you know, whether that means they're liking stuff or commenting or, you know, you're engaging with them. I, I think there's, there's obviously, you know, tangible benefits to being, yeah. you know, socially active on, uh, on, on Instagram, especially during a pandemic, right? You can't, sure. see, I, you know, I haven't seen a lot of my friends for quite some time. So even yeah. still, so yeah. Yeah. Uh, what, um, let's say percentage of uh, results do you think come from just natural talent versus, you know, really learning and building a technical skill set in photography? I would say it's, um, that's a good question. I kind of let, I, I sort of lean towards it's a hundred percent technical ability almost. Okay. I think natural ability or, or like at least the creative eye, um, it's not a myth, but it's sort of, I think people give it too much credence. It doesn't really, doesn't really mean anything. If you can create a technically sound, like the biggest thing is like get something in focus, right? And then go from there. Mm -hmm. um, if you can create a technically sound image, especially if you're, for example, if you're shooting in studio and it's lit well and it's clear what it is you're looking at and it, if you're trying to sell like for example e-commerce you're trying to sell something just create a good image it doesn't have to be you know creative it can be quite like uh mechanic like mechanical in the way you sort of go about it it's like you know you set something up you measure it you light meter it and then you photograph it and then that's it yeah um so i, I think depending on what you're doing i think that that scale or that percentage changes but i would still say like natural ability or natural aptitude towards it certainly accounts for a little bit. I think for me, it accounts more for um, an interest in it. So rather than being something that composes an image, like, or like it's a percentage that like the image is comprised of, it's more of, uh, I was able to achieve that 100% technical success of the photo because I was interested because of that natural, that natural aptitude towards it. So is yeah. that is that similar to like uh, like when you're taking shots for for sporting events uh because maybe you have a familiarity with the sports you know what to anticipate and what shots to look for is that is that what you mean yeah that's sort of it like um you know having a natural interest in what you're doing will kind of lend itself to better images right like for example shooting baseball yeah. um uh, my first my first contract job outside of outside of school was with major league baseball as a real-time correspondent. And 
I had no sports photography in my portfolio at the time, but I had a strong portfolio of, of studio images, of fashion, um, landscape, architectural stuff at that point because of stuff that I had done in school. Mm -hmm. And I had a really strong background in baseball. Like I played competitive baseball throughout high school and college. Um, so they were like, well, you know, we obviously see you don't have any sports work, but you have a deep understanding of baseball and you obviously have a deep understanding of photography. Let's take a chance. And that sort of was the catalyst that launched my at least sports photography forward. Cool experience. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. I don't know if I can break that down into percentages, but I, I think um, I get the idea, though. Yeah, yeah, it's sort of one thing leads to another. But I think at the end, like at the highest level, it's no longer about the creative eye and it's literally just about delivering quality images, which is strange to say. <laughs> But I, I think I think the creative eye sort of just comes comes through naturally after a while. Makes sense. Yeah. Experience. Yeah, exactly. I think that's a really good segue to to the next topic we wanted to talk about, which was your early years. Um, how did you know? How did you get to where you were today? So you mentioned uh, you had done graphic design mm -hmm. um, and that you had worked, uh, you know, doing some photography on the side. How, how do you think those experiences that you've had and what other experiences helped you get to where you are today in your photography career? Yeah, well, I think crucially, it sort of came from uh, being interested in Photoshop. Okay. I think like my, my base interest in Photoshop, I think began when I was in grade seven, so I was 12. And I started just messing around in it because I was like, oh, this is a fun little, a fun program. Like I, I can, you know, create some fun things with this. And so that sort of built, you know, throughout high school, I started making graphics, a lot of sports graphics. So like desktop wallpapers or signatures for, um, for forums online, that sort of stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, just participating in those sorts of communities, just graphic design community, sports graphic design communities, and, and just sort of, um, you know, continuing to learn and challenge myself to become a better designer. Um, and then, yeah, after high school, I said, this is what I want to do. I want to do graphic design in sports. Um, and so I went to Humber College for gra advertising graphic design. Um, and I also was playing varsity baseball at the time. And I think my priorities got a little yeah. mixed up and I was definitely more focused on baseball. Um, and so I didn't really pay a lot of mind to school at the time. Um, and and uh, I sort of became disenchanted with graphic design as, as I you know continued towards that. Uh, I left Humber College after a year. Um, and sort of was like, you know, I, I feel like a lot of the classes were a little bit too rudimentary and I wanted to sort of give it a go as a freelancer. So I worked as a freelancer for a little bit. I ended up on a on an internship um, with a uh, with an online magazine. And then, um, you know, I probably gave it about a good two, two and a half years as a as a freelance and contract graphic designer. And I just became really disenchanted with it because I was doing I was doing work for a lot of clients that weren't quite sure what they wanted to do. Okay. Um, and I started to realize that I wasn't really that good either. And so it was sort of this mix of, you know, I, I would work two weeks on, on concepts for somebody and then they still wouldn't like what they saw. And I was also saying, man, like, I, you know, I probably should have put a little more effort into this. I don't think I'm as good as, as I think I am. I don't know if I can deliver on this. And it became a little bit frustrating. Yeah. And I was like, you know what, like, you know, I've always liked, like photographing things. And I love the immediacy of digital photography, right? I can take a photo and if the client doesn't like it, they can see it on the back of the camera and I can be like, do you like this? And then they, they'll say yes or no, right? Mm -hmm. And that sort of the immediacy, I think is a big thing. I always go back to that whenever I talk about it. The immediacy of photography really changed sort of the way that I approached a lot of my projects. So again, we talk about monetization. Yeah. When you work for two weeks on a project, especially as a young graphic designer, a lot of people will take advantage of, of you know, your inexperience and your naivety. Um, and you won't get paid until you deliver something. So if I was working on a project for two weeks and, you know, they still didn't like what was coming out of it, that would essentially be two weeks of 
nothing of just wow. lost time and lost income. And that was really like, obviously unsustainable, right? Yeah. So it's like, well, how do I, how do I, you know, I still want to do something creative. I have these skills. I've been, you know, at this point I was probably 22. I've been work, you know, using Photoshop pretty much daily since I was 12. So I have 10 years of good experience. How do I continue to use these skills that I've developed um, and, you know, create quality work that I can be proud of and I won't get frustrated with. So uh, photography was just sort of the natural, um, the natural conclusion to that or the natural answer, the answer to that question. Um, and then, yeah, so I applied to OCAD. Um, actually, I applied to OCAD earlier than I went. I got in and then I found some work as a contract graphic designer. And then I, you know, I sort of gave it one last shot and was like, you know what, this isn't for me. So then I finally decided to go to OCAD for photography. That was uh, early 2014 and then, uh, or sorry, late, like September 2014. And then um, that sort of got the ball rolling. Do you find it's difficult also sometimes to deal with clients' expectations in photography? So you mentioned immediacy, but for example, sporting events, uh, I'd imagine you don't get to really show the, the shots you took until yeah. after the event, right? Um, yeah. How do you find those level of expectations and do you, like, what's the difference there between your experience in graphic design? It's totally different. And then I think it also sort of lends itself to um, to sort of the experience of, of, of or at least my experience, I guess. Um, it's, uh, there's a lot more trust, right? You know, as an older, more experienced person now, yeah. uh, my clients trust that they're going to see good images. Right. Like I have a, a, you know, a strong portfolio and people can look at that and they say, oh, this is this is what to expect. Um, so I, I think the expectations uh, of clients are. You know, it, it's it's twofold, right? Like I am I'm more experienced now and I, I know I can create good work. Mm -hmm. um, so there's there's less there's less of that frustration, right? Cause it's, you know, like yeah. I said, I, it's not a situation where I'm like, oh, I don't know if I can do this. Like, I, yeah. I feel like I can do everything. And if there's something that I don't know, uh, I, you know, I have the, I have the, uh, the mental fortitude now to say, you know what? I don't know how to do this and I'll bring somebody on that can help, right? Or somebody that has more experience, for example, like uh, lighting something in studio, right? Uh, if there's a very specific lighting setup that maybe I may not be familiar with, right? So for example, uh, you know, a very, very stylized portrait with just like a little bit of like a beam of light on the face and then everything else is dark. Mm. And I'm having trouble, you know, accomplishing that. I have a wide network of people now that I can say, hey, look, I'm working on this project. This is what the client wants. Can you help me set this up? Oh, that's great. Yeah. yeah. It's is that common in photography to kind of reach out to your network? Definitely. It's so strange because it's hyper competitive, but it's also super collaborative. So Interesting. Um, I think, I think generally speaking, everybody is fairly protective of what they're doing. Everyone's so, you know, people that are established have their, their niche that they sort of stay in. So yeah. I do sports, that's sort of my niche, but um, you know, there are other things that I do. So I will do portraiture and I will do weddings and I'll do food and that sort of thing. And, and there are a lot of, a lot of people in Toronto, specifically in photography, and there are a lot of people that have a really great idea of how to do, you know, a couple things or many things. Um, and yeah, generally speaking, it's a it's a very all tides raise all ships attitude. Everybody sort of helps everybody. Generally, it's a good attitude. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's, it's and great honestly, yeah, and you can't like people. I think now, really, especially at the I would say at the beginning of like the Instagram era it was really competitive and people were not helpful. People yeah. were very, very protective of what, what it was they were doing. And I think people realize that, that that's just unsustainable and it doesn't work. I, I think that people realize that there's a lot more work to go around if you know you kind of share it or you ask for help and, and you you know build something with the network. And uh, yeah, I, I think that's really important. I think that's that's something that I, I realized from like a pretty, from a pretty young age, to be honest. like. A uh, friend of mine uh, and myself, uh, Brian, started, uh, Brian Glazer started a company called Glazed Media when we were just at, out of high school. Um, and it was sort of serving as like a, like an umbrella of mm. creative. So we had me doing photography, Brian doing videography. We had another guy, Aaron, who was doing web design. Uh, we had um, a girl, Alex, who would do photography, videography, graphic design. 
Um, and, you know, our, our goal was to sort of expand it beyond that. I don't know if we ever really got beyond that, but what we did do was sort of offer like a one stop shop for people that were looking for right. creative services. And it was sort of under this one umbrella. And, you know, we realized that like, you know, we can accomplish a lot more if we pool our resources and pool our skills rather than try to pull away from each other. So it, it's nice to see that that sort of um, translated or, you know, the transition from my attitude to it's definitely like a, uh, an industry wide thing now. Yeah. That's great. And I, I imagine that's not only good for uh, obtaining new business because then you don't limit yourself to only what you know, yeah. but uh, then you, you can also learn right from other people. hundred percent. I, you know, I still, you know, I'm, only 29 now or 28 turning 29 soon like I, you know most of the guys that i work with at least on the sports side are in their 40s 50s and some even in their 60s right so they've okay. been doing it for a really long time and um yeah like if you stop learning you know you're falling behind especially in a medium like photography it changes so quickly right i mean the yeah. biggest change in the last little while has been from dslr to mirrorless right and uh, a lot of stuff is actually changing from still photography to video. Um, I'm probably quite a bit behind on video because I don't really have, uh, I have my, you know, high quality still photography cameras, but I don't really have anything that does video that well. Do I want to mm -hmm. do video? Yes. But there's barriers, right? There's financial barriers to that. But um, it's quite expensive, I imagine. Oh, it's unbelievably expensive. Yeah. <laughs> like if you want to do something of quality, like, you know, your minimum cash outlay is going to be something like 10 grand. Wow. Yeah, just to get sort of started. So the high barrier <laughs> to entry is weird. That said, um, I know a lot of younger photographers that, you know, they they rent stuff for, you know, they, they book gigs, they go to school for it. They don't own their own stuff, but they rent stuff. And it's totally, that's totally normal and definitely something that I would recommend doing yeah. if, uh, you know, you're not ready to drop, you know, 10 grand on a new camera system. It's like, yeah, it's it's a lot. It's a lot. But yeah, I don't know. I forgot what the question was. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Let's, uh, I was wondering if you could maybe give some of your insights on um, how you found formal education in photography and maybe what the pros and cons are of that. Yeah, that's an interesting one. Yes, because OCAD is a very interesting school. It's very uh, conceptually based. So a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the work that we would do in our classes was sort of... Um, more around building building concepts, uh, fleshing out ideas, and really making up making something that has a coherent and cohesive method or uh, not method, sorry, a message, right? Um, rather than focusing on creating uh, visually appealing work, which is really interesting because I feel like the students that came into OCAD with an already solid or better understanding of the technical side of things really excelled because they were able to sort of take concepts and they were able to execute on them and create unbelievably good work. But that was very few and far between. I feel like the majority of students that I was in school with were not prepared uh, to take on the technical side of things. Mm -hmm. And at OCAD, I think they sort of, they don't stress the technical side of things enough. That said, there are schools that do do a really good job at the technical side. Like I know Ryerson Image Arts program is really great for that. It's quite quite balanced um, in terms of uh, you know technical versus conceptual. And then uh, Sheridan College has just an unbelievable photography program. That just you know I, I don't know I, I don't think I've met anybody uh, that came out of that program that isn't incredible. Like they're just they come out and they're ready to work. Um, they're ready for the uh, for the demands of, of the uh, of the industry as as professionals, rather than what's happening at OCAD, which I think isn't necessarily a bad thing, but I think that it's um, you know if somebody wants to practice as a photographer right away out of school, coming from OCAD, they'll have a bit of a difficult time because I don't I'm not sure the technical side of things is mm -hmm. is there. So, um, so where could somebody learn this outside of say university education? How could they maybe develop these skills? Practice is the biggest thing, right? Like, just like, you know, sports, you know, if you, you want to become better at soccer, go kick a ball against the yeah. wall. Or whatever, <laughs> right? 
uh, play with your friends, shoot with your friends, have fun, you know? Um, I think, you know, we touched on it earlier. I think the biggest thing um, to building the skills is having that natural inclination to want to, to want to learn more. Right. So, um, you know, as much as you want to say, you know, if you want to, like I said earlier, the percentages, I, like I said, I think it's a hundred percent technical side, but you don't get to learn solid technical stuff uh, without being interested in it in the first place. Yeah. So just, you know, if, if you want to, if you want to grow as an artist, the most important thing is you have to enjoy it. So you have to be doing stuff for fun. If you're not doing stuff for fun, then I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> you're not, you're not going to grow. Yeah. So for those who want to say pursue a career in photography and you know, they're trying to figure out what that next step is. What, what advice would you give them about how to navigate their career? Should they specialize? Is like, are there specialties to focus on early on? Should they be a generalist? That's a tough one. Um, it, you know, people obviously are entering photography from different points in their lives, right? You know, yeah. I'm lucky in sports there, you get a, such a wide variety of people entering, uh, entering into the field. You have kids that are in high school and they've shot for, you know, their high school newspaper or, or you know, some yearbook or their high school sports teams, and they have a good background in sports and they're able to get into, a, you know, like a CFL game. Right. Um, and conversely, you have guys that are in their 40s and 50s and they're like, you know, they're thinking about retiring and, you know, they're picking up a camera for the first time, and, you know, or not the first time, but, you know, they sort of built up a little bit of a skill set and they want to enter into sort of a, uh, you know, secondary income situation where, you know, they're shooting a hockey game or a Jays game on the weekend, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, I think the biggest thing is um, enter into whatever it is you're doing with an open mind and know that you don't know as much as you think, you know, <laughs> be humble, right? Like just yeah, understand sure. that, understand that any sort of creative field, it's, you're always going to be learning and the field is always going to be changing, right? People will, it's always going to be evolving. Like I said, right now, it's really, things are shifting quite drastically towards video. And I think eventually video will, will be the dominant, um, the dominant medium. I don't think it is right now. Uh, I think it's fairly split, but I think eventually, you know, most people will be shooting video. That said, uh, photography to me is, is a medium that just doesn't seem like it'll go away at least not for four years, right? And people say, it was funny when I was starting, oh, photography, what are you gonna do with that? And it's like, well, have you ever like looked at anything? <laughs> like look at like, if you walk down the street and you look into storefronts, you'll see within a five minute walk, like at least a hundred photos. Yeah. Like there's, there's a photo, behind, there's two photos behind you, albums behind me, how many photos yeah. are there? So it's just, it's, it's pervasive, it's everywhere. It's photography is omnipresent. So it's one of those things that, there are a multitude of ways to make an income or make a career out of it. So no matter what, uh, what step you're, what stage you're at, uh, in life or in photography, just always enter everything with an open mind and understand that you can always learn more and you can always get better because without that you, you're completely lost. You won't have a chance. Yeah. So what's, what's next for you in, uh, as you develop your career? Yeah. Uh, well, I think, immediately just sort of getting back to how things were pre-pandemic uh obviously working in sports it's been it was very disruptive so i had to sort of uh to pivot from that i think probably about 80 percent of the work that i was doing pre-pandemic was in sports wow um, yeah i didn't really have much of a need to do anything else uh, the the um the time that it consumed was you know it it was prohibitive to uh, doing anything else and and income wise it was you know sufficient um obviously with the pandemic and having all of the major sports leagues in north america uh you know go on hiatus or you know have restrictions when they return back uh was was definitely uh a challenge so you know very quickly pivoting from hey look like you know i've done all this sports work i've done a little bit of this other stuff um and trying to uh trying to sort of, uh, you know, make a, make a go out of, uh, out of something that was really only taking out, 
twenty percent of my time uh, was it was a challenge at first. So uh, still sort of on the recovery side of things, but it you know things are moving right since the beginning of July as things have opened yeah. up in Ontario. It's been it's been nonstop. Like I've been I've been working pretty consistently throughout through the week and, and on the weekends since then. So right. it's been it's been it's been good. But yeah, you know, just to sort of get get back to where things were pre pandemic um would be would be great and then after that uh you know once the ball gets rolling i want to eventually teach i think uh i think a lot of us can relate to that teacher that's teaching without experience you know yeah whatever it is and i think you know in the business world if you have somebody that you know is is teaching about marketing but they've just been entirely in academia their entire lives it's like well you know great you have this amazing background uh you know high education but you know, what do you know about actually, you know, being in the field? Yeah. You have no, world. no real, <laughs> yeah, no real world experience. It's really difficult. And I think in photography, especially at OCAD, unfortunately, there are a lot of teachers that really focus on the academia of things. So, you know, they'd go to OCAD for photography and then they would go to York as a master's of photography program. And it was all very conceptual very uh, history of photography based and um, they come back and teach and they'd be totally lost on uh, on the technical side of things or or even just on you know how to approach clients or how to you know approach cold calling or how to how to market yourself effectively that sort of stuff so I, I you know I want to eventually give back uh, in that way and sort of be be that teacher that does have a lot of experience and, and I think you know, you touched on it earlier about when people are entering into the, into photography, should you be a generalist or should you specialize? You cannot specialize in photography. You absolutely can't. Um, you know, you, I think at a certain point, if you, um, if you really establish yourself as like an industry leader in something, uh, you, can, you can start to specialize then. But until you get to that point, there, specializing is just, uh, you know, it's, you know, cutting your nose off to spite your face, essentially, right? It's just you're giving yourself, uh, you're giving, you're, you're cutting off avenues to success for yourself. So, you know, you don't want to set up invisible barriers like that. You, they just, they don't exist. So why, why bother implementing them, right? Do as much as you possibly can, learn as much as you possibly can, try as many different styles as you can, work in as many different fields as you can. Like, you know, off the top of the chat, I work in sports, weddings, portraiture, and food consistently, yeah. at least once or twice a week in each of those things. Plus, you know, whatever else comes up, right? So and you see that expanding. Yeah, all the time. Yeah. It's, you know, pre pandemic, I was doing a lot more like lifestyle stuff. So, you know, fashion stuff. Like, one of the first projects I actually worked on uh, during the pandemic was for Roots. Okay. So, doing, doing fashion stuff. Um, I actually have a background in fashion and jewelry photography prior to working in sports. So, um, you know, constantly, constantly keeping your mind and, and ears open for new opportunities is, is, is crucial. So, yeah, with all that experience, I want to one day, uh, you know, offer, offer advice, I guess, to, to, young people that are trying to uh, do the same thing and follow in that sort of in that path. And so teaching would be, I think, pretty, um, pretty rewarding for somebody who's done that. And yeah, you know, that's great. Said, Good teachers oh, always needed. <laughs> yeah, they, they always man. And, and like I said, like, I think it's so crucial to have somebody who's, um, who's done it, yeah. or he's still doing it to, uh, you know, to learn from. You know, it's it it becomes less teacher relationship and more mentor relationship, and so that mentor thing is is huge for me. It's great to hear. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Lucas. Really appreciate your time. Uh, this has been a really interesting conversation, and I'm sure everyone else has really enjoyed it too. Cool. Yeah. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad you had me, and I really hope that uh, if you've made it this far, you were uh, interested in uh, what I had to say. Absolutely. <laughs> Cool. So yeah, if, uh, you know, if anyone else, if anyone's listening to this or watching this and they, you know, want to learn more about me um, or get in touch with me, I'm sure you can put my Instagram up. It's just at Shishang. So it's my last name, difficult last name, but 
we'll definitely share that with the audience. Awesome. That's perfect. Thanks again, Lucas. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs>